right, we're convening the Committee on Judiciary. <laughs> One more time, testing, testing. All right, we're convening, uh, convening the Committee on Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs. It is Wednesday, February 24th, 2.06 p.m., uh, conference room 325. First on the agenda, we have HB 1028 relating to the Koke State Park Advisory Council. We have DLNR in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. Um, the department stands on its written testimony offering comments and we're available for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that's all the testifiers we have. Members, do you have any questions? All right, hearing none, next up is HB 1022, HD1, relating to the taking of natural resources. First up, we have DLNR in support. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Chair and Committee members, Jason Riedula, DLNR's Enforcement Chief for the department. We'll stand on our written testimony in strong support of this administration measure. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Kuaina Ulu Alamo in support. Aloha Chair and Vice Chair. My name is Kevin Chang. I'm the co-director of Kua. Uh, we're just here to express our support and stand on that. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up we have For the Fishes in support. Aloha, Vice Chair, Chair, Committee members, Inga Gibson for the fishes. We'll stand on our written testimony in strong support. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up, we have Moana Ohana in support. Is Mike Nakachi here? Yes. Yeah, aloha. Aloha, Chair. This is Mike Nakachi. Stand on uh, written testimony in strong support. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that is all the testifiers we have for this measure. Members, any questions? Representative Ward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, deal in R, please. The question, in, in what instances do you actually need this to detain somebody? And what does it mean by detain, at least in your definition? So uh, thank you, Rep. Um, Jason Redula again, DLNR's enforcement chief. Um, so this particular inspection authority would only apply in hunting and fishing activities. Um, with regards to the term detention that is in our testimony or within the bill, uh, this is meant to be a temporary stop of the individual for purposes of conducting the actual inspection. Temporary meaning... And our, in our, you know, detention can be, depending on which third world country, it could be a month, could be a week, could be a day. What is, what is the department's definition of temporary? So, so with regards to um, the amount of time um, for the limited and temporary detention of the individual, it, I, I, I don't really want to characterize it as detention but moreover, it's, it's just a, a stop of the individual um, where we believe, it, where we have a reasonable belief that they're engaged in the taking of natural resources. And then it would be for the amount of time for us um, to actually request consent to inspect any of the um, closed containers that the individual may have where we believe the natural resources can be found. And um, if, if they refuse at that point, that's when we would make a formal demand for the, um, to basically see three things, the, any natural resources in the possession of the individual, any methods of take, and any licenses or permits that the individual may have. Um, so the length of time is gonna vary, um, but it's not meant to be for an extended period other than for the purposes of, of conducting the inspection. I totally agree with you that the use of the word detain may not be the most appropriate, but it's used in the bill. And yeah, that's where it kind of, to me, puts a bit of, um, puts a little bit of an alarm uh, ringing, if you will. Uh, the other last question I have, Chair, is are these generally fishermen, hunters, or who, who are the that are getting away with this that you want to clamp down and detain them? Who are the guys that are doing? So, 
the actual inspection authority will be limited to hunting and fishing activities. So generally speaking, this is going to apply to those who engage in hunting and fishing activities. So but, hunters and fishermen. But who are the bad actors? Are they mostly fishermen? Are they mostly hunters? Uh, and how many times have you had to uh, not being able to do without the bill? I'm sorry, Representative, could you repeat the question? You kind of got cut off at the end. I'm looking for a frequency. I'm, a, I'm kind of a metrics guy. Uh, how often have this has this been a problem? And are they primarily fishermen or are they primarily hunters? How often has it happened? So it does happen, it does happen from time to time. Um, for the most part, many of our hunting and fishermen are individuals who follow the law and do provide um, access and allowance for us to inspect their catch. However, um, there have been times in the past where people have refused inspection and, and that's where this bill would attempt to address that gap. Um, I don't have any um, statistics right now to provide you. We'll have to get back to you on that. So it could be one or a hundred or maybe less than that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, HVAC, if I may, Chair. Did they, HVAC has testimony, did they show up to the hearing? I do not the believe The Hawaii so. Fishermen's Alliance for Conservation and Tradition? I don't believe they did. Are you on the line? If so, okay. Yeah, they, they, they indicate they're not going to be here. Not there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And members, any other questions? Representative Lowen. Thanks. Just a quick follow-up for DLNR and maybe um, for, for the fishes, I guess, since that's who's on the line. Um, the, if you want to describe, I mean, I know that there were incidents in um, in my district on the Big Island where people have been um, charged recently with illegally illegal take of fish. And I know that in order to um, pursue this and catch them, it took tremendous effort from the community to, to be able to accomplish that. So as I understand that, at least that there may be other incidents but as far as what I'm familiar with in my district, this is one instance where this bill would help to make it easier to apprehend bad actors. Uh, as you know, hopefully there's not too many of them, but we know that they're out there. So can you confirm if, if that's one of the situations where this would help? And also what kind of um, effort had to be made in order to be able to apprehend people for breaking the law without this bill? Aloha, thank you so much for the question, uh, Rep Lowen. Um, you're exactly right. Um, we've actually worked on this measure with um, Doe Care for a number of years and just wanna point out that this is not a novel concept. This is this is something that is present in basically all other state, federal, uh, state wild and wildlife enforcement agencies. So they're not asking for any um, authority that isn't already granted to, to state um, wildlife enforcement agencies. This is something that has needed to be clarified for some time. And you are correct. Um, there have been actually eight individuals cited over just this past year for uh, aquarium collection related violations. Um, those individuals, uh, we and community members had been reporting to Doe Care for a number of years. I don't know how many of those individuals um, Doe Care attempted to inspect their catch um, but regardless, that, that is a prime example of why this would be necessary, because if there is a reasonable uh, belief that there is an offense, um, don't care as the feds, NOAA and others are already also allowed to do, should be able to inspect um, with the cooperation of the individual. And um, I would guess that uh, based on the cases that we've seen recently where NOAA was involved and was able to exercise um, that same, the same authority that Doe Care is requesting, um, that would it would absolutely aid in uh, enforcement and efficiency and, um, and a, you know, an important tool for Doe Care to have. Thanks, and I guess, uh... DLNR, if you want to also just from your perspective, what are the challenges of trying to apprehend these poachers without this um, the extra authority that would be granted in this bill? So I, I think the real challenge, um, Representative, is that we are talking about perishable natural resources that if we have to spend hours of time to conduct surveillance and to build um, probable cause for a criminal case, we are endangering um, the, the well-being of these resources and the ability to return them 
to their natural habitat where they can live another day. Um, I think in, in, in the particular instance that you're mentioning on the Big Island, our officers spent hours of time conducting surveillance um, so that we could make a case against these individuals. And, and I'll just point out with, with regards to the, um, the inspections that were conducted on these individuals vessels and on their catch, um, because they were commercial fishermen, there is already statutory authority for um, inspections of commercial fishermen just because they hold a commercial marine license. Um, the inspection authority that we're asking for here is, is different from that authority, which is already longstanding. All right, any thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Jerry, is, is OHA one of the testifiers? Uh, I do not believe they're, they're not, they okay. indicated they were here. They, they brought up a good point about cultural uh, practice, traditional practices being thwarted by this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there's no one else, we'll move on. Uh, just a reminder, testifiers, when you're doing your initial testimony, please try to keep your initial testimony to two minutes. All right, HB 1021, relating to the Interstate Wildlife Violator Compact. First up, we've got DLNR in support. Uh, yes, uh, Chair, Committee Members, Jason Redula, again for DLNR. Uh, we stand on our written testimony in strong support of this administration measure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, Hawaiian Humane Society in support. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Member Stephanie Kendrick for the Hawaiian Humane Society. Uh, we'll stand on our testimony in support of this measure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For the fishes in support. Aloha, Vice Chair, Committee Members. Thank you. Uh, strong support. Uh, this is another measure that we have worked with the department for some years. I just wanted to mention that, um, unfortunately, this is something that does need to be done um, statutorily. We, um, many years ago, pursued this via a resolution um, and it was determined that this is something that needs um, a legislative approval. So strong support and hope this is the year that Hawaii becomes um, one of their, one of the last two states to become a member of the compact. So hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll join this year. Thank you. Hope so too. Uh, that's the last testifier. Any comments or questions, members? All right, seeing none, moving on to HB 663, relating to the Game Management Advisory Commission. We have one testifier for this, DLNR with comments. Hi, this is Jason with DLNR on behalf of the uh, administrator, David Smith. Um, thank you, chair and committee members. Um, we stand by the um, testimony provided. Um, I appreciate the intent of this measure um, and provided comments. Okay, thank you. Members, any questions? Right, seeing none, moving on to HB 1030, relating to the Aquatic Life and Wildlife Advisory Committees. One uh, testifier, DLNR in support. Aloha Chair, committee members, Brian Nielsen, Administrator of Division of Aquatic Resources. We stand on our written testimony in support. Thank you. All right, thank you. Members, any questions? All right, seeing none, moving on to HB 1031, relating to the Hawaii Historic Places Review Board. We have one testifier, DLNR, in support. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, members of the committee. The department stands on its written testimony in support. Yeah, thank you. Members, any questions? Okay, seeing none, moving on to HB 1071 HD1 relating to the University of Hawaii Board of Regents Independent Audit Committee. We have one testifier from the Office of the Board of Regents in support. Chair, members of the committee, Kendra Oishi from the Board of Regents office, uh, standing on our testimony in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any questions? Representative Ward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the Regent, please, Kendra. Kendra, hypothetically, if this bill was in place, would the Stevie Wonder blunder not take place? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not sure, but I think the, the hope is to basically increase the uh, region's ability to, uh, you know, manage um, risk against the university by, uh, you know, through this bill. 
So that's uh, maybe, maybe it would have done. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, you know, one of the things that this bill that we're asking for is um, to allow for executive sessions on, you know, financial matters, which uh, currently it does not look like um, they are allowed to do unless, unless it's involving something related to like a legal matter. But I think the hope would be for them to be able to have discussions before something turns into a legal matter. But didn't we grant autonomy to the University of Hawaii five or six years ago? And isn't this a bit of micromanaging to have to come to the legislature to figure out how many different kinds of criteria to appoint somebody as your audit? I just find that a little bit invasive on our part, or this is the only way you guys can go. Uh, well, we already have this committee in our bylaws as well, but um, I guess the legislature at that time also felt that it was necessary um, to put it into statute, but you would probably have to check with whoever it was that initiated this when it was. Who did you have to do this? It's not that you couldn't do it in your own bylaws then. Uh, well, in terms of the, the part about the, um, the committee membership, we could do it through our own bylaws, yes. Okay, thank like you. The executive session stuff, we would need a statutory change, though. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, moving on to HB 546, HD 1, relating to education. First up, we have Office of Hawaiian Affairs and support. Aloha, my Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members. Uh, Lemomi Fisher, Public Policy Advocate for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. OHA stands on its written testimony in strong support of HB 546 HD1. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you. Next up, we have the Executive Office on Early Learning in support. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members. I'm Jordana Ferrer with the Executive Office on Early Learning. We stand on our written testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mahalo. Okay, thank you. That's all the testifiers we have scheduled. Uh, members, any questions? Seeing none, moving on to HB 1118 HD1 relating to campaign spending. First up, we have the Campaign Spending Commission in opposition. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Gary Tam, and I'm here on behalf of the commission. Uh, the commission will stand on its written testimony in opposition to this bill. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have Common Cause Hawaii with comments. There you go. Really Thank you for your comments. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stand on the written barking. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sandy Ma for Common Cause Hawaii. We submitted written comments with concerns about this bill. While we understand the intent of the bill is to provide transparency in elections, we're not quite sure how this could be um, actually enforced given the federal IRS guidelines. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Members, any questions? Representative Ward. Thank you, Chair. For um, the Campaign Spending Commission? Yes. I read your testimony. I'm not sure why, why, generally speaking, anything that's more stringent, you guys are in support of. What, what's, what's the rub with this one regarding dark money that, that you've testified against? Yeah, so the commission is, of course, uh, in favor of more transparency, but Commission, having gone through uh, a challenge to our rules in the Yamada case, don't want to have to go through another challenge like that. And the first problem that we see in this bill is that it's, it's trying to broaden the definition of non-candidate non committee. And that was directly at issue in the Yamada case. And the court in that case upheld our definition, the state's definition of non-candidate non committee. Uh, but by making it broader, uh, there's a risk that now if someone would sue again with a more broad language in there, that a court might find that the language is indeed now too broad and overturn it. Um, the second problem that we see is the reporting of uh, donors to a 501c4. Um, uh, so the specific concern there is there needs to be a nexus between uh, the person being reported for giving money uh, with our campaign finance system. Uh, 
So if someone just goes out and gives money to a five or nonprofit, that is not a, a, a contribution under our system. There would have to be more. The, the, for example, if the donor gave money to a nonprofit and says, you know, I know you guys have some activities and I want you to use this money only for political activity. Uh, that would supply the nexus, I think, uh, but not just the mere giving to a 501c4. So are you saying that the bill basically is not necessary given what you have got already in the book? No, I, I'm, I, what this bill is trying to do is reach the donors of 501c4 uh, without doing much more. Uh, uh, there needs to be a nexus between the donors that give to 501c4 or any nonprofit and campaign spending. That, that's, that's, that's all we do. We're, you know, we're campaign spending commission. We regulate campaign spending. If a person doesn't give money that's related to campaign spending, then the commission doesn't have jurisdiction over that person. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. If we pass it and there's no nexus, what do you do? Uh, In other words, does it make a difference that there's no nexus? It, it doesn't seem to be part of the, the rationale. Even though you're saying it should be a, it sounds like a constitutional issue, even though there's not such a thing for campaign spending. If there's no nexus and we do pass it, uh, what happens? The well, no nexus doesn't, it's not a poison pill is, is, is the point, correct? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know what it is. It, it could be someone could challenge it. Someone who is like, uh, uh, who gives to a nonprofit. And if the commission is about to force that non, uh, force non-candidate committee that receives money from this nonprofit to disclose all of the donors of the nonprofit, that's where the problem will come in. You mentioned the Yamada case gave you a lot of headaches. How much money did that cost the taxpayers? Uh, the, the only, the, I know it costs more, but we, the commission itself was on the hook for some supplemental attorney's fees for the appeal. But that case took like five years. Uh, Attorney General's office spent a lot of uh, time and energy on that case. And you're saying this kind of because it's broader may even invite another Yamada type possibility. I'm pretty sure it would because the attorney that filed that lawsuit, that's all he does. He goes around the country challenging uh, states campaign spending laws. And one of the issues, as I mentioned, one of the issues was it was whether or not our definition of non-candidate committee w was too broad. So the court, uh, the Yamada case at the district court level and the uh, Ninth Circuit level found that our definition was not too broad. What this bill will do it is it will make the definition more broad. So that just plays into the argument that was made uh, uh, in the Yamada case. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, Rep. Rep. Nakamura. Yes, um, for Mr. Kim, I was just um, noticing in your testimony that you are um, asking for a attorney general opinion. Um, on uh, this bill, and I, I don't see any testimony from the Attorney General. So um, it seems like um, that would be helpful before we make a decision on this bill. Is that what you're recommending? That's what my, my recommendation would be. As a agency, you know, we cannot speak towards the constitutionality of our statutes, but th that is what the Attorney General can do. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I've got some. I've got a couple for Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, Gary, it, in the dicta for the Ninth Circuit or U.S. District Court opinions, uh, did it? Did the court, either court, indicate that uh, we were right at the edge of the expansiveness in defining non-candidate committees? Or, or rather, was there any dicta indicating that if we were to expand it further, that they would strike it? No. Okay. So even though it would be subject to a challenge, there's no prior dicta or any holdings by any previous court that would indicate that we would uh, lose. Is that correct? Uh, 
They are correct, but uh, what this bill will do, it, will, it takes out one of the principal parts of the definition, which has the purpose of making or receiving contributions. I think, I think that's the main point about that whole definition. I understand, but I, I just want to know if there's any prior court uh, rulings that were, or opinions or dicta that we're ignoring. It does not seem like there is. Yeah, I'm not aware of any. For, for the nexus argument too, I, I'm wondering if you're if people are donating to a committee or a, a 501c4 that they know has the ability to do political spending, don't you think that, I mean, uh, to me, that seems like a sufficient nexus that you're donating to a group that you know can do political spending. It, it seems like a pretty uh, thin veil that's protecting them, if anything, saying, well, I didn't know that my money was gonna be used for political spending. Uh, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. But in order to apply our law to the person giving money, I, I think there's got to be more than that. I could be wrong. Uh, you know, I, I think if you, if like I, like I said in my earlier testimony, if a person giving to the a nonprofit is saying I'm, I'm uh, earmarking the contribution for political spending, that's 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 definitely a connection there, or. To, I'm earmarking this for electioneering communication, but just by giving money to a uh, nonprofit, which many people do, um, you know, I, I, if there's something in there that they, they need to sign when they give the money, like, please understand that, you know, this committee, uh, you know, takes it to the limit of how, what nonprofits can do in political spending. You know, if you don't like that, then maybe you shouldn't contribute you know, I don't know what it would take. There's not, you know, there's not much case law on that, on, uh, on nonprofit political activities. No, yeah, sounds like we're about to make some then, if this bill passes. Um, thank you, though. I, I do agree that there is, that there, if there was an explicit nexus of them saying it, that that would be very clear. I, I think where we disagree is probably that there is an indirect nexus in contributing to a group that you, the donor probably knows is involved in political speech or activity. Um, my last question is uh, Schedule B, and, and forgive me, I, I am no tax expert, but prior to President Trump taking office on Schedule B, uh, 501c3s had to list all donors over $5,000. Do 501c4s, I'm sorry, I might have said 501c3s, do, do 501c4s still keep that information of donor and, and uh, donor amounts, donation amounts, I suppose? You report it or keep it? Or are, are they required to keep it? Uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I know they don't report it. Okay. Um, and then if, if they were required to disclose it through Schedule B prior, I'm assuming there wouldn't be any new privacy uh, rule that we're violating uh, were we to ask them to disclose that kind of information now. Is that fair? If, yeah, I mean, if you report it in a place that anyone can access. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Members, any further questions? All right, if not, moving on to the next page, HB 239. HD1 relating to campaign advertisements. First up, we have the campaign spending op spending commission in opposition. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this is Gary Cam again, and the uh, commission will stand on its written testimony in opposition. Yep, thank you. Next up, we have Common Cause Hawaii in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Sandy Ma for Common Cause Hawaii. We support HB. 239, we think it will provide better transparency um, as to what actually is a multi-page political advertisement. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the testifiers we have. Members, any questions? Representative Ward. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ma, is this the midweek? Um, the, 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 <laughs> I'm a Mia Bill, <laughs> question mark. It, it could very well address that situation. Yes, Rep Ward. Seems to look exactly like that. Uh, you know, we're told that sometimes people have five to seven seconds that they'll read something, uh, at least one of our brochures. I don't know about if it's on page one, do you think that people would know rather than page three? We or, think, thank you, Rip Board. We think that if it's a multi-page ad, it's, uh, it's good to have it on, um, on the first page of a multi-page um, advertisement. 
so that people will know that uh, it is um, a political paid political advertisement. Common Cause received uh, multiple complaints uh, about the midweek ad. Um, they didn't realize that it was a paid political advertisement. They thought it was an endorsement by midweek. You didn't midweek can recant or do some kind of a recolumi of sorts? Um, I'm not quite sure. They may have after the fact, but uh, um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I can't speak for midweek. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, uh, I just have a quick one for Campaign Spending Commission. Is, is it still your position that the uh, current law is sufficient to handle these kinds of situations that uh, Representative Ward just described? It is. I mean, the, the midweek fiasco, but that, that, that is one of, as far as I know, that has never occurred in the past. Uh, our 11-391 has been a longstanding uh, law in the books. Uh, currently, the most common multi-page ads are campaign mailers, front and back, and the trifolds. Um, I don't believe there's ever been a problem having the, uh, well, the vast majority of disclaimers come at the end, and that's where candidates have been putting them on mailers and uh, uh, and trifolds on the last page. So you're right. Uh, our, that's what our testimony says. We don't see any problems with uh, 11-391. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? If not, we'll move on to HB 671 HD1 relating to the Code of Ethics. First up, we have Hawaii State Ethics Commission in support. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Dan Gluck with the State Ethics Commission. We will stand on our written testimony in support with proposed amendments. Okay, thank you. Next up, Common Cause Hawaii in support. Good afternoon again, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. We support HB 671, and we also um, support the amendments proposed by the Hawaii State Ethics Commission. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's all the justifiers we have. Members, any questions? Representative Nakamura. I have a question for uh, Dan Gluck, please. Uh, Dan, I wanted to ask you, in your testimony, you um, said you preferred the SB version that has 35 rather than 36 categories. So what is the one category you were going to, you think should be eliminated from this list? Um, it's actually more than that representative because not all the categories are the same in both bills. Uh, the difference is that in the Senate version, it includes only people who are paid employees of the state. In the House version, it also includes some board and commission members who are volunteers, such as members of the Hawaii Tourism Authority. And my understanding is that the reason that the governor had vetoed the bill last year was because it would negatively impact recruitment for those volunteer positions. So my, my recommendation is to cut and paste, uh, so cut out of the Senate version um, and put those 35 categories into the House version. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, members, any other questions for board? Uh, Mr. Gluck, the 30 or so, I forget how many are listed, is, is everybody, of no, 37, is everybody included who's on the state payroll or is anybody missing? I didn't see uh, of community colleges, for example. No, certainly not all state employees are covered. This is designed to be the, you know, quote unquote, higher level employees, um, you know, directors of uh, departments, legislators, um, executive directors of agencies and the like, people who ordinarily would have um, direct and ongoing communication with the legislature and therefore might be able to profit from those relationships if they move to the private sector. Do you know who the highest paid public servant in the state of Hawaii is under state payroll? Um, if I recall correctly, it was either the football coach or there was a medical examiner, um, but that might be from the city and county. It's the one who heads Jepson. Oh, there you go. Uh, but is that person or position on here? I don't see it. Um, no, I don't believe so, Representative. But if it's from a taxpayer's accountability, wouldn't you have those high payers listed? So our perspective was that we wanted to reduce the possibility that people would trade on 
the relationships and uh, that they had developed as a result of their state position um, with respect to the legislature. So the, the list here are people who generally are going to have frequent contact with the legislature. Certainly there's room for debate as to um, others that you might want to include, and there could be some on this list that you might want to exclude. Um, generally, we were looking at uh, people who had to file public financial disclosure statements um, or others who might be considered uh, high level employees with frequent uh, interaction with the legislature. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. representative. Okay, members, any other questions? If not, we'll move on to HB 416 HD1 relating to section 711-1109 of the Hawaii Revised Statutes. Up first, we've got the Hawaiian Humane Society in support. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members, Stephanie Kendrick from the Hawaiian Humane Society. We're in strong support of this measure. Um, Hawaiian Humane has been working on improving our tethering statute for several years now. and. Uh, this bill represents a lot of work and a lot of progress. Um, it has meaningful enforceable provisions that will allow both our field services officers here on Oahu and the field services officers in the neighbor island counties who are all in support of this measure um, to do outreach to the public to prevent harm to animals, to rectify harm being caused to animals, and also to educate dog owners about the importance of integrating their canine companions into their human families, uh, which is an issue of health and safety, both for the dogs and for the family members as well. So we are in strong support of this bill and we urge the committee to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the testifiers we have present. Members, any questions? Sure. Representative Ward. Sure. Uh, uh, pardon my ignorance, but what is a uh, trolley with swivels from the, for the Humane Society? I'm not up to speed on that. I'm assuming that's it's a, a, a trolley with swivels is um, a tethering mechanism that allows the dog to have relatively free movement while still being confined. So it's it's quite a humane way to confine a dog if if say you're in a situation where you can't fence your yard or you can't keep the dog inside. Um, we just want to make sure the equipment is set up in a way that the dog can't entangle themselves. But it's it's basically a piece of equipment that you can use to safely tether a dog. And it doesn't move because the word trolley suggests that it's movable, but it doesn't move. Is that That's correct? That's a good point. The, the equipment itself does not move, but it allows the animal to move. Okay, I see. Thank you very much for that clarification. Members, any other questions? If not, we'll move on to HB 1088 HD2 relating to cosmetics. First up, we have Department of Health with comments. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. My name is Greg Edwards with the Department of Health, Food and Drug Branch. Um, we, you have a written testimony. I just wanted to take a moment and just uh, highlight um, what the, right now the department uh, understands, certainly understands the intent of this measure. However, it's unclear what the expectations of the department are uh, in including this language into a statute, HRS 328, that largely deals with products that can cause harm to the consumer. The bill is not addressing um, that, that, um, that these products that would be harmful to the consumer and more deals with the way that they, the research and development occurred. Um, as I understand it too, there's a, a large component with the enforcement for county prosecutors, uh, which is unfamiliar for our office and how we would share enforcement responsibilities there. So we just wanted to highlight um, that and uh, in, send in our testimony. We're available for any uh, questions you may have. Yep, thank you. Next up, we have prosecutors with comments. Mm. Oh, not here. All right, moving on to Cruelty Free International in support. Hi, aloha chairs and committee members. Monica Ingebrigtsen with Cruelty Free International. Um, we are in strong support of this legislation and I would like to call attention to that um, you'll see in the legislation it makes exemptions for special safety concerns and drugs used in cosmetics and other types of um, testing that might take place or come into conflict. And this is a result of working very hard with the cosmetics industry and stakeholders to reach agreements to um, consider the complexities of the industry while achieving the primary and shared goal of, of ensuring that cosmetics are not the cause of new animal testing. We would point out that passage of this bill would bring Hawaii in, law, in line with 40 other countries, as well as three US states, 
that have already had this type of legislation in place for a year. And there are three other states that are poised to pass it this year. We would also point out that um, we agree with remove um, an amendment to remove reference to the um, cruelty statute because it doesn't apply here as the testing doesn't take place in the state of Hawaii. And there is some testimony to um, clarify that point and would encourage the effective date to be returned to um, January 1st, 2022 to match what the other states are doing and, and to um, achieve that these manufacturers are already meeting this, st this standard for three other states. So it would not be a burden and the industry supports um, this bill. With regard to some enforcement, we know in other states, we don't expect that there would not be proactive um, enforcement. It would be complaint driven. And we don't expect, we expect there would be high compliance as there is in other states. And because the industry is supportive, they know that they can meet this standard and um, we'll be available for any questions that you might have. And then we'll stand on our written testimony. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up, we have Pono advocacy and support. Aloha, Vice Chair, committee members. Thank you, strong support. Um, I did uh, want to also echo um, our uh, appreciation of the committee's amendment um, that the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Office mentioned. Uh, because the testing fortunately does not occur here in Hawaii, there is no need to reference our state um, animal cruelty law that even if it did occur here in Hawaii would not be applicable because uh, animal testing is conducted under separate uh, federal laws. So we would ask for that removal, which the prosecutor has proposed in their testimony. Uh, this is the first time in the three uh, years, the three sessions that we've worked on this legislation that the Department of Health um, has testified. So uh, we appreciate uh, their comments and um, I will be reaching out to them separately um, to uh, hopefully address uh, some of their concerns. Uh, the enforcement is with the county prosecuting attorney's office. It's not with the Department of Health. I do hope that the prosecuting attorney's amendment may address some of their concerns. Um, also in the Senate bill, um, there were some comments by the Office of Information Practices. I don't believe they submitted testimony here. Uh, they also had some comments about clarifying some of the disclosure laws um, that might also address some of the concerns um, noted by Department of Health, but I'll leave it to the committee um, because again, OIP did not submit those comments. I just wanted to clarify that this does not impact retailers. Um, this is supported by the Personal Care Products Council, which represents more than 600 manufacturers across the world. And um, as Monica mentioned, um, they are in full support. We have worked with the industry on this for, for many years. And um, with that, we don't anticipate actually the need for really any enforcement because the onus is on the manufacturers and they are working and supporting this bill with us. So strong support and happy to answer any questions. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up, Hawaiian Humane Society in support. Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Member Stephanie Kendrick for the Hawaiian Humane Society. Uh, we'll stand on our testimony in support of this bill, and we also support the amendment suggested by the prosecutor's office. Thank you. Thank you. That's our last testifier. Members, any comments or questions? <laughs> just, just questions. No comments. Report. Uh, uh, Inga, may I ask you a question? How does one know that a animal test has been used in the manufacture of the cosmetic? Is there a, a labeling or is it a known practice or how, how does one know when, when a cosmetic has animal testing engaged? Thank you for the question, Representative Ward. Um, if I may ask Monica, um, she is really the expert on this and has worked in other countries and all the other states that has adopted this legislation, Monica. Sure. So this is one of the reasons why we put the onus on the manufacturer. So you wouldn't, um, that's why, and also why it would be complaint driven. You wouldn't necessarily know just by looking at the product or the ingredients, but what we would know is that animal testing typically takes place in a brand new ingredient. And that would be the flag for um, where animal testing might take place. Uh, the existing ingredients all have existing data, which is grandfathered in. So there would, um, not be the proactive enforcement, it would be a tip off or complaint driven where an ingredient was known to be tested on animals or was new. We have the data, the, the manufacturer has the safety data that they're relying on and can provide that safety data um, to, to show what which tests they have used. Do you have an estimate of what cosmetics that exist today have animal testing as a basis of their manufacturing? Um, it, if they're using Existing ingredients, which are grandfathered in, um, at, at one time, most ingredients were tested on, on animals, but in recent years, 
there's been much less animal testing because, because A, the, there is existing ingredients, and because we do have modern alternatives to test for things like skin sensitivity and eye irritation that don't use animals. So it's definitely something that is um, being phased out. There is some testing that takes place, as you'll notice in the, the bill, we talk about when an ingredient is used in, a, in, a, um, in two different products, including cosmetics and non-cosmetics, and that's why we worked out some um, compromise language there for the, what we call a dual use ingredient. So it's, it's shrinking, but we do estimate worldwide half a million animals are still used in cosmetics testing every year. And these are primarily what kind of animals? Um, rabbits, guinea pigs, mice and rats are the primary animals used for cosmetics testing. And last question, what percentage of the existing products would be affected by this bill? Um, existing products would not be affected because it only impacts new animal testing. So products that are currently on the shelves, whatever data that they used, if it was animal testing, that is um, basically grandfathered in. So it only impacts brand new animal testing, which is not required for existing ingredients. It would be in the development of a brand new ingredient that's not yet on the market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Hey, members, any other questions? Okay, if not, moving on to HB 553 relating to the protection of sharks. First up, we have the University of Hawaii in support. Judy, are you there? Not present. Not present, okay. Next up, we have DLNR in support. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. The department stands on its written testimony in support and provides two suggested amendments to the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Center for Biological Diversity and Support. Aloha, Chair Max Phillips, the Center for Biological Diversity's Hawaii Director and Staff Attorney. We'll stand on our written testimony in support with needed amendments, three amendments that are necessary for the enforcement of the bill. Mahalo. Yeah, thank you. Next up, we have For the Fishes in support. Aloha, Vice Chair again, Inga Gibson. Thank you so much. Um, as many of your, as you may know, and many of your colleagues on the committee who have worked this bill with us, this has been a work in progress for about seven years. Um, we're really excited um, that this may finally be the year. As you all know, back in 2010, Hawaii became the first state in the nation to enact a landmark shark fin bill and um, has since become a global initiative. This would complement the effort um, by uh, adding further protections to sharks from intentional killing. Um, it's important to note um, that the bill, as, as you know, Chair, as an attorney, um, includes the highest mens rea, the highest state of mind knowingly, because the intent of the bill is not at all to impact those ethical fishers who may in the course of lawful fishing, accidentally capture a shark and release the shark. That's exactly what ethical fishers do now. And that's exactly what we want um, for them to continue to do. Um, there are a couple amendments um, that we are requesting, really critical amendments um, from that were made in the previous committee because they really do present some gaping loopholes in enforcement and actually could impact, undermine our existing shark fin bill. So I did put in my testimony, which I believe is also in OHA's testimony and a number of other folks' testimony um, regarding uh, deleting sections four and five on page four, lines nine through 11, um, relating to subsistence fishing and also relating to incidental take. Um, subsistence fishing and Native Hawaiian cultural practices are already exempt in the existing bill in section G. So we don't believe that um, subsisting fishing exemption would be needed again, because um, we also uh, continue to have concerns as DLNR noted in their proposed amendments regarding the IACUC, uh, the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee exemption. Unfortunately, the IACUC, um, which is what the researchers are proposing, there's no public review component to that, um, to that process. And, and thank you. So um, we would just really urge the committee uh, to support the three critical amendments that we and many others uh, submitted. And hopefully um, we can get this measure uh, through this year to extend protections to these um, highly imperiled species. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up, we have Moana Ohana in support. Mike, if you're there. Aloha, Chair and uh, Vice Chair Matayoshi. Um, Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Mike Nakachi here on uh, Moku Okeabe, um, representing Moana Ohana and Malama Mano. Um, as many of you know, um, Mano, I think everyone here is in agreement to protect Mano throughout the Pai Aina. 
Um, but again, as Inga so eloquently spoke earlier with respect to um, the amendments that happened in the previous uh, hearing, I unfortunately missed that. You're opening up a fishery, which is not what we're trying to do. And for those folks in Kauai that maybe use um, juvenile hammerheads, I, I equate that to indigenous people in um, the First Nations using, um, let's just say bears to go and feed squirrels to catch squirrels. So you do not use a deity or an almakua to go and catch akuli. Use something else. That is a modern practice that you have now developed. But again, you are disrespecting Mano in their highest form. As for the other exemption, um, we are in the state of Hawaii. And um, DLNR and Division of Aquatic Resources need to um, be the konuiki of all of our Hawaiian waters. So it is imperative that they have an SAP for anyone poking, drilling holes, hooking, uh, mano. And as long as it's done in a matter that is um, um, with cultural sensitivity to the mano, um, I'm for it. But again, I'm here on behalf of Mano and uh, support the bill, but would like those amendments um, looked at a little bit further. And I appreciate your time, um, Vice Chair Matayoshi. Mahalo. Uh, we have a number of individuals, both in support and in opposition, but the only one scheduled to testify here is Kim Holland with comments. Kim, if you're there. Yes, uh, Chair. Um, I stand by my um, testimony that I submitted, but I specifically want to address the comments that have been raised about the IACUC, which is the permitting process which we as university researchers have to abide by in order for us to do our research. These permits are very, very important and very heavily screened. They are viewed for the need for the research and the manner in which research is done. The straightest line in many ways between conservation of sharks in Hawaii is to have a vibrant research, acti research activities in our state that can elucidate the behavior and movement patterns of our animals so we know in a modern sense how to protect them and that modern science can add on to traditional values. I can give you and the committee many examples already of the way that research that we've conducted has fed directly into the conservation of sharks. And so having a free path for us to continue this under strict uh, monitoring um, is one of the reasons why we support, I support and the university supports in their testimony, um, the use of an IACUC permit as being sufficient for us to allow us to do our very critical research in protecting the animals that we all care about. So I'll stand on my uh, uh, testimony and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have me. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's all the testifiers we have for, to, for this bill. Uh, members, any questions? Representative McKelvey. <clears throat> I guess I'm Inga. Oh, your mic needs to be. No, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, Zoom. Hi, Representative. Uh, hey, how are you doing? A question for you. I know I read your testimony earlier and I saw the three amendments you're asking for and they, they seem to be pretty, <clears throat> you know, a lot of gravitas and, and substance. Um, if the committee were not to adopt those amendments, would you guys pull your support from the underlying measure or would you advocate for it still to continue to move forward? Thank you for the question, Representative McKelvey, and um, thank you also for your amazing leadership on the shark fin bill. I must uh, let everyone know he and I worked together on that bill 11 years ago. Um, we would not oppose um, the, the subsistence fishing and the incidental catch issues uh, being included in the rules that DAR is directed to promulgate. Um, so in that case, we would not oppose that but we would oppose them in statute as they are. We would unfortunately have to oppose the bill um, if they remain in statute. Uh, we believe that um, they are as written, as drafted, it's just too broad. It's not something that we want in statute. 
But if the department, as they mentioned in their testimony, wants to promulgate rules, issuing permits uh, for subsistence fishers, um, which again, we would assume would be Native Hawaiians, then we would be fine with that. So um, I think maybe a compromise would be to remove um, our requested sections four and five, but to keep those considerations in uh, the rulemaking process. Thank you, Representative. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, any other questions, members? All right, seeing none, moving on to HB 1017 relating to crustaceans. Next up, we've got DLNR in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. We stand on our written testimony in support. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Moana Ohana in support. Uh, stand on our testimony in strong support. Thank you, members. Any questions? A oh, quick question. Uh, Dean Long, I'm just a little confused. I mean, I'm, when I look at the bill, it takes out the statutory protection for the lobsters and the crabs for the females. And I guess the justification, at least at the time, was well, we can just do this through admin rules. I mean, why would you want to abolish the statutory protections? I mean, that's what you need to promulgate rules on top of. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask our program manager, David Sakota, to step in. But but basically, when you put put rules in statute, it it just limits our ability to to change uh, and and manage fisheries um, with you know the the best available science. But I'll let uh, David Sakota uh, see if he can address your question. I thank you. Um, we have the statutory authority to promulgate rules to regulate the taking of females of these species, and indeed we have. So we have rules on the books now. Um, the latest science uh, and you know management um, show that at least for Kona crab, we can allow the taking of females in a sustainable way, provided that egg-bearing females are released. Um, so that's what we intend to do, but we're unable to with this statute in place. So we're asking to repeal the statute to give us flexibility. No, I, I'll be honest with you, that's going to raise a lot of concerns, I think, especially in our rural community, with our native Hawaiian community and the neighbor islands, that it would be with DLNR now through rulemaking would be allowing the taking of this resource. So, but I appreciate you giving me some more light on, on that, uh, that issue and that question. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Appreciate it. Members, any other questions? All right, if not, moving on to HB 156 relating to animal control services. Members, we have no testimony on this bill. So if you'd like to make comments, you can do that uh, during DM. Moving on to HB 247 relating to our agricultural lands. First up, we have DCCA in support. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Carol Richelieu, and I'm testifying on behalf of Michael Pang, who is chairperson of the Real Estate Commission. The commission stands on its written testimony in support of this bill and we're available for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Office of Planning in support. Afternoon, Chair and members. Rodney Funakoshi for the State Office of Planning. Soft. Uh, yeah, Rodney Funakoshi for the State Office of Planning. Uh, OP stands in strong support of this bill, which addresses major recommendations of an OP study on subdivision and CPR issues on agricultural land. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hawaii Department of Agriculture in support. Thank you, uh, Chair Mariyoshi. Morris Ata on behalf of the department. Uh, the department stands on its written testimony in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. That's all the testifiers we have. Any questions? All right, seeing none. Moving on to HB 381 HD1 relating to fair housing, reasonable accommodations. First up we have, oh, we only have one testifier, Hawaii Civil Rights Commission in support. Uh, Bill Hoshijo for the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. Uh, you have a written testimony in support and I'm available for questions. Yeah, thank you. Members, any questions on HB 381? All right, seeing none, moving on to HB 352 HD1 relating to secondhand dealers. Uh, first up, we have Kamain alone in opposition. Uh, 
Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, my name is Richard Dan. Uh, I represent Combine alone. Uh, my testimony uh, says pretty much where I'm at with this. Uh, but in addition to that, it really confuses the law. In addition to all the things that are written in my testimony in opposition to this, this confuses 486. I think it should just be a separate law. Uh, take a look at it yourselves. It, 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 you walk through this law and you're all over the place. It, make, it just confuses everything. If you have any questions to me, feel free to ask. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have Eco ATM in support. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Bonnie Garcia, and I am the Director of Legislative Affairs for Eco ATM. We've submitted written testimony, but I want to add several comments. We operate in 49 other states. Hawaii is the only state where we do not operate. And in every state uh, that has a secondhand dealer code, we are subject to regulation under that section. Um, we have worked with multiple states to adopt and modernize codes to uh, recognize automated recycling kiosk and the technology used. And this is legislation that's similar to that. Partnering with retailers and grocers, we have collected over 28 million devices across the United States, which is the equivalent of about 7 million pounds of electronic waste. And the amendments that are before the committee today uh, clarify that this legislation only applies to automated recycling kiosk. Electronic reporting is required to be submitted within 24 hours and remote opening is provided to allow law enforcement to inspect the kiosk at any time. Thank you for your time, but I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you. Next up, we have Retail Merchants of Hawaii in support. And not present. Next up, or lastly, we have Hawaii Pawnbrokers Association in opposition. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. Uh, my name is Jonathan Spiker. I'm the attorney for the Hawaii Pawnbrokers Association. Uh, on behalf of the Hawaii Pawnbrokers Association, we respectfully oppose this bill and ask that you do not pass it. And I'll give uh, uh, the brief following reasons. Uh, automated recycling kiosks are a completely different type of business and a completely different type of industry compared to pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers. Uh, pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers are currently heavily regulated under HRS Chapter 486M and adding automated recycling kiosks to this bill uh, would be very confusing and would distort the existing pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers laws. Um, you know, passing this bill would mean that different industries with different requirements would be governed by the same statute, HRS chapter 486M. And of course in Hawaii, recycling is already governed by other statutes uh, such as HRS chapter 339, 342I, HRS chapter 342G and HRS chapter 445-231. Uh, we're not aware of any automated recycling kiosks in Hawaii. Uh, we believe there is none. Uh, the Honolulu Police Department, they uh, oppose the uh, house companion of this bill. And the last point we wanna make is uh, many of those who support this bill stand to benefit financially if this bill is passed because they can now promote their products uh, in the marketplace. Uh, so for the foregoing reasons, we respectfully ask that you do not pass this bill. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's all the testifiers for this measure. Members, any questions? Uh, Rep McKelvey. Uh, the other members? Yeah. Uh, Rep Ward. Uh, I yield to the dealer on Maui. <laughs> huh? you really Sorry, know? I guess it's on you. Uh, well, Rep Nakamura. Go ahead. <laughs> Rep Nakamura, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I have a question for, was that Jonathan Spiker? Hi, uh, yes. So um, in your testimony, you talked about um, it, the inappropriateness of this being in the secondhand dealer portion of the law, and you suggest that it should be in the recycling section of Hawaii Revised Statutes. Is that? Is that your position that it, this is not the place to be uh, including this new um, operation, the automated recycling kiosk? Yes, Representative. Our position is that it should 
uh, not be in HRS Chapter 486M. Uh, it could be in a different uh, HRS statute or chapter, but not the 486M, which governs pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers. And what is the problem by including it in this section? What, how does that negatively impact uh, the operations of secondhand dealers? Thank you, Representative. I guess our position is that pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers, when, uh, when compared to automated recycling kiosks, it, it's completely different industries. I mean, you go to a pawnbroker or secondhand dealer for to buy things, uh, to sell things, to, to get money or whatnot. Whereas recycling, uh, I guess you could get money for recycling, but other than that, it's a completely different uh, industry. And and um, in a different uh, Senate committee, uh, Senator Baker had testified that there currently are no recycle, automated recycling kiosks in Hawaii. And we believe that is the case as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it looks like we have not received an AG's um uh, feedback on this bill either um, and it's kind of troubling because this is the Judiciary Committee and I think uh, AG opinion should should weigh in on on topics like this in a timely manner so um, I just hope that we can um, I, this is the first time I'm on this committee but maybe that's a comment for later on thank you thank you very much Thank you, Rep. Kelby. Uh, I just want to build on Rep. Nakamura's question. What about, I mean, even in the recycling chapter, it could potentially be a little problematic. What's to the proponents, I guess, what's the matter with it being in its own chapter? Because it's a brand new entity and it's nothing like pawnbrokers where you actually buy stuff and pawn them and sell stuff. It's not just recycling the electronic pieces and components. So what would you say to that, having its own chapter for this um, type of program? Mr. Chairman, if I may answer the question. Uh, the reason why we're in the secondhand dealer code in 49 other states is because they're regulating an item that may have a serial number or an identifier number. If you're putting a can or bottle into a recycling machine, it's just for the value of that recycling item. The reason why we are subject to secondhand dealer codes and the state of Hawaii, Delaware, Florida, California, Michigan, Minnesota, and a bill on the desk of the governor in Utah today um, put us within the secondhand dealer code is so that we appropriately report any item with a serial number to law enforcement so that they can track it for you know, purposes of whether it's an unauthorized sale. We are not asking to be excluded from that provision. In fact, we have included a provision where we electronically transfer that information to law enforcement within 24 hours. This bill only addresses those items purchased through an automated recycling kiosk and would make us and anybody else that operates an automatic recycling kiosk that buys items to the current provisions under this code. Okay, okay, thank you. So one of the question, I, I, I mean, I believe the pawnbrokers pay fees for the program. Are you guys going to be willing to pay any fees that may be associated with being included in this chapter? Absolutely, sir. We, we not only pay for the state licenses and permits, but any local licenses and permits as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Ward. Thank you, Chair. And building on the questioning from my colleagues from the neighbor islands, uh, I would ask uh, Ms. Garcia, being that you see this nationwide, could you explain to me, and excuse my ignorance, what is a recycling kiosk and what does it have inside of it and what does it look like? So um, attached to my testimony is a copy of a sample uh, report that is sent on each sale. Um, Eco ATM is a sister company to Redbox and Coinstar, which you may be very familiar with on your island. We partner with retailers and grocers to place the kiosk next to the cash register area so that when consumers come into the store, they feel safe. It's in a well-lit area and they 
you know, continue with their retail transactions and add dollars to your sales tax coffers in the local community. The kiosk looks very similar to a red box machine. It is green and white. When a consumer wants to recycle a broken or old cell phone, they uh, use the touch screen on the, on the kiosk. It will give them uh, an evaluation of what the device may be worth. And then it will evaluate it between poor condition and excellent condition and make an offer to the consumer directly on site. Now, consumers have the ability to take their old devices back to their carriers, to sell it online, to sell it to Best Buy, GameStop, um, or any other uh, secondhand dealer on the island. The consumer drives the choice. We have greater than 4,000 machines across the United States and Europe and work with over 1,500 different law enforcement agencies across the United States and Europe. And who owns the machines? Oh, excuse me, sir? Who owns the machines? The machines are owned by the company. There is no franchise agreement, and the only placements are done in partnership with major retailers like Walmart, Albertsons, Kroger's, um, and they're placed within the footprint of the store. Wait, say again, they're owned by who? They're owned entirely by the company, EcoATM. There is no franchise agreement. They're not individually owned, and they can only be placed in partnership with a retailer or grocer, and they're placed within the footprint of the store. And they are the only ones in the country that has this, quote, machine. There are other competitors in this marketplace, and the reason that we, we in working with legislation, not just in Hawaii, but across the U.S. where legislation has already been adopted, we set the bar incredibly high. We want to make sure that everybody reports each and every sale regardless of value, that the sale is uh, transmitted electronically to law enforcement in any manner that they want, whether it's on a Leads Online, BWI Rapids, fax machine, computer, however they operate locally, that it's done within 24 hours, and that it also provides for remote opening of the kiosk so that law enforcement can inspect it at any time. Do you have a financial interest in, in that company? I am an employee of the company. I see. Um, and I don't know what a red box is. What is a red box? Is it, I know a Coke machine, I know vending machines, but I don't know oh what a red box God. machine is. <laughs> a red box machine you will find usually inside a Walmart or grocery store, you can rent videos for your families for about $2. Oh, that, that sounds like uh, the traditional kind. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Chair, I had a question. Uh, Representative Lopresti, is that you? Yes, sir. Hi. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Ma'am, I had a couple of questions. Do you guys then, with the products that you get, would you refurbish and distribute those items? Actually, we have a green focus. Our mission is a greener planet. Climate change, uh, our interest in Hawaii obviously is aligned with your interest of a sustainable Hawaii and uh, global warming. And about 65% of the devices that are purchased are recycled for parts or refurbished. The other the rest of the inventory is refurbished for reuse. On average, the consumer trades in or abandons their cell phones every 18 okay. months to that's 24 yes. months. And there's about 70% life left. Thanks. So that's a yes, right? You guys refurbish them. Yes, sir. Um, Cause we just passed a bill on the floor today that is about requiring us to force people to refurbish their electronics, HB 516. Are you guys familiar with that bill? I am familiar with that bill and that's a producer responsibility um, focus. What this is, is you own your device at the end of that live stream, your choice, what to do with it. And most people just throw it in a drawer or throw it in a trash. Yeah. So no, I totally support, I'm a former Sierra club executive committee member. I totally down with recycling things. It's just, it seems strange. I don't see your guys' testimony in that bill. Cause this bill seems to be changing the law to benefit your employer's business model. And then that bill forces us to use your business. And it's just come all coming together to me because I can read <laughs> that it, it, they both directly benefit you guys. How come you guys aren't commenting on the other bill? Well, we're not a manufacturer of devices. 
we are in the space of buying used items. And so we would be in the same place that Best Buy or GameStop or your pond dealers would be. Um, most states have adopted a recycling focus based on the manufacturers, either through a stewardship program or through a, a state managed program okay. to ensure that manufacturers help pay for that recycling. I'm yeah, that, that sounds fine to me, but I just seems fishy to me. These two things all of a sudden moving like this and you guys are commenting on one, but not the other one that benefits you. It's just, it's very strange. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, members. Any other questions? Sure. Difficult on report. Uh, as a follow up to that, uh, is there and we are in the process of having a run on catalytic converters on our electric and hybrid cars. Is there any data, and I doubt you would have it, but it seems as though, is there an iPhone uptick in theft when you put one of these machines in? It sounds like you, you grab the iPhone, you throw it into this machine, you get, I don't know, 10 cents on the dollar or something. Does, does this uh, recycling of cell phones encourage theft or do you have any numbers and if you did probably it wouldn't be to your benefit to tell yes, me sir, i do have that and in fact there is a, a white paper that was done by the university of berkeley a few years ago uh, in fact in 2014 minnesota was the and and uh, excuse me um for full disclosure i'm a former legislator as well from the state of california so i've worked on your side of the aisle as well and i i have a deep dive understanding of this issue. In 2014, the state of Minnesota, followed by the state of California, forced legislation on cell phone manufacturers in 2014 to include a kill switch provision to help track stolen phones. Because before that, there was no way to track a stolen device. So when somebody sells a cell phone today, they are the, the seller is going to uh, whatever source, and they're looking for an international identifier number known as an IMEI or an MEID. And now working through the federal government, they've created free websites where the buyers can check these numbers. As a result of our, our kiosk, for example, has a built-in security feature that looks for that kill switch. In addition to that, it's a misnomer that you're just dealing with a machine. A live operator also approves each transaction in real time. And we run two background checks while you're standing in front of the machine. The first one is we're looking for that security number and we're using Leads Online or BWI Rapids, which is the same pool that your law enforcement agencies dump lost and stolen items into. If there is a hit, we decline that sale. In addition, if you reported that device stolen, uh, you have an insurance policy and that's a second a database that we run a security check against, and that's called CheckMend. So while you're transacting the device in that four or five minute cycle, we're electronically interrogating the machine and we have the ability to decline the sale. And then if we move forward with that sale, that number is, if you look on the sales report that's attached to my testimony, it's part of the official record sent to law enforcement within 24 hours. And if you look on your cell phone uh, sitting on your desk right now, if you turn it over, you will not find a security number stamped on that. You would have to look for it electronically embedded in your general settings. And that's how the kiosk uses technology. So you're saying as I stand in front of the kiosk, I put my phone in, you're going to do a back che background check on me and my phone. I'm going to do a background check on your phone. Oh, I thought you said the background check on the person also. No, sir. The phone. The, your, your phone is interrogated. There, the uh, kiosk has multiple ports in it. When you plug in your phone to it, it will electronically read your serial number and compare it against the stolen database. Oh, so if it's not on the stolen database, it's okay. But if I, if I just pick it out board, of it. I think we're getting a little off topic here. This is to, uh, you're, you're okay. asking about the mechanisms of their transaction yeah, i just want to see if it's recordation cool. okay i yield to whatever i just had one quick pertinent question it's a slight <laughs> just, uh, i beg your pardon but no no i didn't mean no aside no aside just uh, real quickly could somebody 
could like one of our dealers in the pawn industry, couldn't they just go ahead and set up their own machine and own systems as long as they went ahead and met with the requirements of law? I mean. That's correct, sir. And we welcome the competition. Okay. What, what we want to ensure is that anybody that comes into this space. Uh, we've learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Appreciate <laughs> okay, thank you for thank your you. service to uh, the people of California, Ms. Garcia. <laughs> thank you. Remember, that seems to be all the questions. Let's move on to HB 486 HD1 relating to transportation. We have two testifiers. First, deal and R with comments. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee, Russell Tsuji for deal and R. We'll stand on our comments. Available for questions if you have any. Thank you, Department of Transportation in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair members, Lena Rocky Regan from the State Department of Transportation. We stand on our written testimony and support and are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Members, any questions? All right, seeing none, we'll recess for decision making. Recess. <laughs>
Okay, uh, reconvening committee on the Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs. For decision making. Okay, members, uh, House Bill 1028 relates to the Koke, uh Park State Park Advisory Council. Um, Chair's recommendation is that we move it out as is. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as is. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1028 as is. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Representative Ichiyama. Excused. Representative Kobayashi. Aye. Representative Lopresti. Aye. Representative Lowen. Aye. Representative McKelvey. Aye. Representative Nakamura. Aye. Representative Takumi. Aye. Representative uh, Todd. Aye. Representative Tokioka. Excused. Representative Board. Aye. Hey, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 1022, House Draft 1, related to the taking of natural resources. Chair's recommendation is that we move this out. Uh, so, uh, chair notes it is uh, already defected. Uh, chair's recommendation we move this out as is. As is. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as is. Okay, chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1022, HD 1, as is, noting the previous excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? With reservations, uh, report. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Hey, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 1021, linked to the Interstate Wildlife Violator Compact. Um, Chair's recommendation is uh, we adopt the U.S. Humane Society's amendments. Um, and that's it. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair with amendments. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1021 with amendments, knowing the previously excused members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 663, House Draft 1, related to Game Management Advisory Commission. Uh, bill is already defected. Chair's recommendation is to move this out as is. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as is. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 663, HD 1, as is, noting the previous excused members. Mm -hmm. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, uh, HB 1030, House Draft 1, related to aquatic life and wildlife advisory committees. Um, Uh, Chair likes to, would like to note that uh, within the um, the bill, uh, there is a reference to the chairperson of the department on page three, and uh, that it should be changed to chairperson of the board or director of the department for clarity, because the chairperson of the board is the chairperson of the board and they are also the director of the department, but they are not the chairperson of the department. So I would like to uh, note that uh, change for clarification. Um, otherwise, other than that, uh, pass it out, uh, pass it out with that one amendment. Members, any questions or comments? If not, the vice chair as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1030 HD 1 with amendments noting the previous excused members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, HB 1031 related to the 
Hawaii Historic Places Review Board. Um, Chair's recommendation, you move this out as is. Members, any questions or comments? Being none, Vice Chair, as is. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1031 as is, noting the previous excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Hospital 1071, House Draft 1, related to the University of Hawaii Border Regents Independent Audit Committee. Um, Chair will note that there are uh, some Ramsar uh, errors that will need to be corrected, and uh, the bill is already defect dated. So, um, other uh, technical amendments needed for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, uh, as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1071, HD 1, with amendments. No the previously excused members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you, uh, members. HB 546, House Draft 1, uh, relating to education. <coughs> Uh, members, Chair's recommendation is that uh, we pass the bill um, with a sunset after 10 years. Uh, that's to uh, provide an opportunity to revisit this issue uh, in 10 years in case you know things have changed. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 546, HD 1, with amendments noting the previous six excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? Rep Takumi with reservations. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, HB 1118, House Draft 1, related to campaign spending. Um, Vice Chair has amendments. Yep. Uh, the committee will be amending subsection eight on the last page to uh, read now a list of donors contributing more than $5,000 in the aggregate in an, in an election period uh, to address certain concerns by uh, certain testifiers, including the AG's office, I believe. Mm -hmm. okay. Members, any questions or comments? Sure. Uh, Awards. Uh, you know, the Campaign Spending Commission was pretty adamant, not necessarily opens it up for a Yamada case, which tied up the Campaign Spending Commission for five years or over. Uh, not sure what we gain out of it versus what we may lose, so with reservations. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I just want to thank the Vice Chair for those amendments. I was going to be reservations, but I'm hoping that fixes it, so I'm up. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions, comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Chair's recommendations to pass HB 1118, <coughs> HD1, with amendments, noting the <coughs> reservations of Representative Ward. Any other members voting with reservations? Okay, Representative Nakamura and Lowen. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 239, House Draft 1, related to campaign ad advertisements. Um, the uh, Campaign Spending Commission uh, indicated that this was not necessary. And as I think about it, um, you know, I, I've put together multi page brochures and I've not put a disclaimer on every page there. So, Chair's recommendation is that we defer this uh, bill. Uh, House Bill 671, House Draft 1, related to the Code of Ethics. Uh, the bill already contains a, a defective effective date. Chair's recommendations pass it out as is. Any questions, comments? Okay. I, I, do have a, Representative Lockover. I do have a comment that if the governor um, vetoed a similar bill, and we're using the same language in the bill that was vetoed uh, due to the volunteers serving on boards and commissions, then um, it may reach a similar fate unless we make the changes that the uh, campaign 
planning commission recommended. So, um, I'll support it with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Representative. You, I, I do stand corrected. We do have amendments for the bill. Yeah, uh, we, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. We, we do have amendments based on the Senate version that should address the governor's concerns. Thank you. So those amendments will be made. Did, did you still want to vote with reservations? No. Okay. Okay, so uh, so there are uh, uh, amendments to uh, correct the concerns of the uh, testifiers. <clears throat> so members, any other questions or comments? Seeing none as amended, Vice Chair. Yeah, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 671 HD1 with amendments noting the previous excused members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, HB 416, House Draft 1, um, creating to Section 711, 1109, how you revise statutes. Um, on page four, uh, line two, in addition to any penalty authorized for persons convicted of an offense under section, uh, the court may pursuant to uh, 706 624 order attendance at uh, education classes concerning animal abuse and prevention. So that would be uh, an addition uh to the um to the bill uh technical amendments needed for clarity consistency and style members any questions or comments seeing none vice chair as amended chair's recommendation is to pass hb 416 hd1 with amendments noting the previous excuse members any members voting with reservations any members voting no your recommendations adopted. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, HB 1088, House Draft 2, related to cosmetics. Uh, chair notes um, concerns raised by the uh, prosecutor's office, and uh, we'll uh, adopt um, that uh, <coughs> their amendment. Uh, also, other technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. Uh, I also like to defect date this to July 1st, 3021. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1088 HD2 <coughs> with amendments, noting the previous excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? Reservations, Gene, uh, Representative Ward. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. HB 553, House Draft 1. Um, Chair's recommendation is that we adopt the LNR uh, proposed amendments. Um, other um, technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. And bill is already defectated. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair has amended. I'm Chair. Uh, Representative McKelvey. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to be going with reservations because I think some of the other amendments offered um, were worth keeping in existing law. So just because of that, we'll do that. Okay, thank you very much. Members, any other questions, comments? Hey, Vice Chair, as amended. Chair's recommendations to pass HB 553 HD1 with amendments, noting the with reservations of Representative McKelvey. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, HB 156 relate to animal control services. Um, it's 1017. No, I'm sorry. Almost missed the crustaceans. <laughs> okay, HB 1017 relate to crustaceans. Uh, technical amendments need for, to correct uh, RAMS error. Um, members, any questions or comments? Hey, if not, Vice Chair with amendments. Oh, Rip McKelvey. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I'm just going to be going with reservations because I, even though they have rules to this effect, I think taking out the statutory protections for our lobsters um, is kind of a dangerous precedent. I think you could have fisheries being set up <coughs> by Gilanada through rulemaking somewhere down the road. So uh, with reservations because of that. Okay, thank you very much. 
Members, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair uh, with amendments. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 1017 with amendments, noting the reservations of Representative McKelvey. Any other members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. HB 156 relate to animal control services. Uh, recommendation of the chair is to pass it out as is for Kauai. Members, any questions or comments? <laughs> Representative Nakamura. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> hey, anyone else? Okay, if not, uh, as is, Vice Chair. The Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 156 as is, noting the previous excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. HB 247 relate to agricultural lands. Uh, Chair's recommendation to pass this out as is. First questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as is. The Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 247 as is, noting the previous excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, HB 381, House Draft 1, we to fair housing, reasonable accommodations. Um, General note that uh, in guidance from uh, Housing and Urban Development, um, a person who seeks an accommodation has a, uh, has a disability that seems to accept other forms of verification other than letters of, from a healthcare professional. So uh, we will need to um, amend this uh, bill to um, reflect that uh, guidance from HUD. Otherwise, um, that's the only amendment. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 381 HD1 with amendments, noting the previous excuse members. Any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. HB 352, House Draft 1, relate to secondhand dealers. Um, I think we had some pretty long discussion on that, but I think uh, we will go ahead and leave the uh, current um, citation and uh, placement of the law um, as written, and uh, we, we will have time to uh, revisit it again in conference. And so uh, members, uh, as is, any questions or comments? Sure. Representative? Sure, I feel very uncomfortable regulating an industry that doesn't even exist yet. And the testifiers don't have exactly what you would call an arm's length distance. I'm not saying it's inside trading, but I didn't see anything that merited this coming to the legislature at this very <laughs> premature time even though it's for a good cause, but it says you're only going to do cell phones. Well, somebody else who wants to do cell phones and say uh, uh, tablets, uh, this bill says it's, it's for cell phones only. I don't get the idea of doing a regulation of an industry that physically is not even in the state of Hawaii. Uh, that is perplexing, and with that, I'm between it with reservations and unknown. Okay. Thank you, members. Any other questions or comments? Seeing mm -hmm. none, Vice Chair, as is. All right. Uh, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 352, HD1, uh, as is, noting the presence of Representative Ichiyama. Any members voting with reservations? With reservations, Representative Ward. Any members voting no? Okay, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Finally, HB 486, House Draft 1, related to transportation. Um, church recommendations, there's a technical amendments needed for clarity, consistency, and style, and uh, uh, Ramsayer uh, correction. Uh, bill does contain a defective effective date. So, members, any questions or comments? 
Seeing none, Vice Chair, with amendments, Chair's recommendations to pass HB 486 HD 1 with amendments, noting the previous excused members. Uh, any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. We are adjourned.